Yeah. Right. So yeah, I think we've got everyone. Day two. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome, yes, to session one, day two. Uh, good day yesterday and an equally busy and equally exciting, uh, if a virtual local good camp can be deemed exciting, I think it can. Um, and um, this morning we're starting off with, um, it's quite an interesting, uh, interesting title actually, I wish they had this in Ikea, um, which is, 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 is something that I would, you know, I don't think Ikea needs anything else. It probably needs some stuff removing and then having this put in it. But we're going to hear from uh, De uh, Jenny Nelson, Luke, Dr. Luke Smith and David Scott um, around the learning from the How Busy Is Tune project, uh, which if people aren't aware is a, a sort of real time data project helping and supporting those uh, living in the Newcastle uh, area in keeping safe from COVID with real-time data, we're going into the uh, Newcastle City Centre, um, but rather than try and steal their thunder with very little knowledge and information, I'm going to hand over uh, to Jenny and David, um, and over to you guys. Um, <laughs> ironically, I've just received a message from Jenny saying she's just dropped off. I'm off back. Floor. Oh, she's back now. I'm back. Goodness Excellent. me. Right. Are we ready to go? Sorry, I missed yeah. that bit. That's all right. I was just, uh, well, I was just poorly introducing you, giving a, a very quick, you know, my summary of what the How Busy Is Tune project is. And then I handed over to you to silence. And I wasn't this there. This time I hand over to you in virtual real life. So over to you, Jenny. Great. Are you all right? To will you be keeping an eye on the waiting room, Nick? Yes, I will. Perfect. Excellent. Um, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Nick said, I'm Jenny Nelson. I am the Digital Newcastle Programme Manager, but you've got a treat of a, a three-headed presentation this morning uh, with my colleague Luke Smith, um, who's Deputy Director of the Urban Observatory, and David Scott, who is from um, Hedgehog Lab. And I'll let them introduce themselves a bit more um, as we go through the presentation. So you won't have to listen to me uh, for, just talk for all of the time. Um, and we'll also um, be really good if you could actually get involved. So um, if this is this is very daring considering I've just dropped off, <laughs> um, but there's a couple of times where we were going to try and maybe get you involved and get some of your um, feedback. So if you've um, maybe used it before or maybe not, um, it's a website called menti.com. So grab a phone or if you're really brave, um, open up another tab uh, on your laptop or PC um, and enter that code and um, we'll come back to that as we come through the, the presentation. So before we get too much into how busy is Tune and, and, and how they wish they had it in IKEA, um, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of Newcastle and I guess some of the foundations that we've been putting in place in order to, to put us in a position to be able to respond to the pandemic with something like How Busy Is Tune. And sorry, but if you have seen me present before, you will have seen this uh, diagram. I think we're definitely due another one. Um, but actually the reason we had this diagram pulled, this picture pulled together, was to highlight the breadth of activity within the Digital Newcastle programme. So from supporting digital skills, from a sort of playground, a PhD perspective, to um, delivering and enabling a significant connectivity infrastructure, whether that's fibre or public Wi-Fi or 5G enablement um, to creating opportunities for SMEs and digital businesses within the, within the city um, and obviously not surprisingly given that I'm from Newcastle City Council delivering using all of that to deliver better public services we recognise that that all fits together within our city and need to be addressed within one sort of city programme so Digital Newcastle is, is fundamentally that, a city innovation programme. It's just very much evolved over the last few, few years from something that was much more narrowly focused on the digital transactions between the council and residents to something that's much more place-based, much more about different organisations within the city, whether that public, private, academic, um, local citizens um, coming together to recognise that the challenges that we face in the city, whether that's um, you know, climate change or ageing, um, 
responding to global pandemics um, can't be solved by one organisation. It really does need that, that whole city, whole systems approach. And certainly, you know, economic renewal is one of those that we all need to work very collaboratively on. And those are huge challenges, let's be honest. Um, but we do feel that in Newcastle, we're facing them with, with these strong foundations that we have in place. So I mentioned about um, the tech and digital sector. We've got a really uh, thriving tech and digital sector of which Hedgehog Lab is a fantastic example. So a digital consultancy headquartered in Newcastle, working with really big name clients like Deliveroo, Toyota and Newcastle Council, obviously. Um, but employing people all around the globe. And we also have some amazing academic in assets as well. So uh, particularly on the data side, we have the National Innovation Centre for Data um, and the Urban Observatory, both based on our Newcastle Helix innovation site, but, but more to come on that. And you'll notice in the top left, uh, we do try and sort of promote the fact that we were recognised as Digital Leaders Smart City of the Year last year. And we were actually only last week Newcastle was named as one of only four UK cities on the IMD Global Smart Cities Index as well. So actually, but when people say, well, what, what, what's really a smart city? For me, it's always been about the way that we're able to work together, work collaboratively across those different sectors to improve outcomes for people within the city, to make things better for them in the way that they live and experience their lives, not just in the way that they interact with the council. Reduce costs in public service delivery, you know, is a bit of a no brainer. We need to we need to try and use digital to, to help do that. But also, actually, how do we make Newcastle a really interesting and attractive place for investment and growth? So how do we use our digital Newcastle work to to grow businesses, to grow jobs um, and promote Newcastle as a, a great place to come and do test beds and trials? And of course, test beds and trials. Um, should be <laughs> driven by data. And I mentioned earlier, Newcastle is really fortunate to have this a, a strong sort of data presence within the city. And what I'm going to do is stop there and hand over to Luke to tell you a little bit more about the, the open urban data that we have in Newcastle and how that sort of set the, set the foundation, as I say, for, for building on how busy is Toon. Um, so yeah, I, I, I um, and my colleagues run um, this thing called the Urban Observatory, which is, I want to say it's a smart city demonstrator, but maybe it's not a demonstrator anymore. Um, and, and picking up on, on what Jenny was saying about, you know, smart cities not being just about technology and sensors and data, uh, I'm, I'm now going to ignore all that and talk about how many sensors we've got and how much data we've got. Um, so we, we've been running this network uh, across the region, not, not just uh, within the university, but as a sort of collaborative uh, thing with, with a number of local authorities. Uh, but we are, we are, of course, headquartered in Newcastle at the university there. Um, and we've been, we've been going for about three years now. We've collected literally billions of observations um, uh, with, with a network of sensors that is partly our own uh, and partly pulling data from other sensors and, and sort of curating that data. Um, so when it comes to smart cities and, and you know, doing uh, clever, sensible things uh, with, with data to make better decisions, uh, COVID happened. Um, and, and obviously we, we are left with the situation where the, the greatest challenge of our time, uh, perhaps, we, we need to respond to that. So um, across the region, there's, you know, there's air quality, there's, there's weather sensors, there's highway cameras and, and things like that. Um, and, and really, um, in, in early March, we were asked the question of, well, what can we see about what's happening in the region and how does that correlate to the spread of COVID and, and how do, should we be responding? Um, so if Jenny goes to the next slide, um, the, um, one, of the, one of the assets that the region has uh, in, in common places with like London um, is, is this enormous network of highway management cameras. Um, and it, you know, it looks it looks a little bit Orwellian. Um, these are these are low resolution still images sent maybe every minute. Um, they're not they're not used to uh, to peer through my curtains or anything like that. Even though one of the cameras is dangerously close to my house, um, they they are used to manage the network. Um, and and actually, before the Urban Observatory, these these images existed, but they they weren't archived anywhere. Um, they were just used to detect whether or not a car had broken down or, or a, a crash had happened. Um, so 
with the the awesome, incredible, uh, confusing power of machine learning, um, we we take all of these images um, and we turn them into. If you if you go to the next slide, Jenny, <laughs> uh, we turn them into something that looks a little bit more like this. So um, what we've done here is we've counted um, basically every every car, every person, every van, every lorry, every cyclist that you can see in there. Uh, you may be able to see in that purple graph at the bottom that cycling cycling was going up um, during COVID, um, and and this is this is not just done uh, in Newcastle now. This this approach has been rolled out um, nationally wherever wherever there are highway cameras that the ONS could get their hands on. Uh, they've taken some of our machine learning models and they now use that as part of the faster indicators to say uh, what's happening to the economy, you know, how much how much people are shopping. And over the, over the last few days, we've started to maybe see uh, the, the, first, the first signs of a decrease in that as, as COVID resurges. Um, so that's, that's from sort of still images and that's on the, on the simpler end of, you know, machine learning. Um, but then if you, if you flick to the next slide, um, this, uh, this is uh, a video that shows what Newcastle is always like. Everyone is always happy. It's always sunny. Um, there's always something going on. Um, and, and if you see all the green, all the green grass there, which, which is not real grass, uh, it's, that's a road that was caused during the Great Exhibition of the North. And we set up a, um, a high density monitoring network during that to see um, in, in this area, especially what was happening, um, how people were using the space. Um, and actually to collect an evidence base that, that may eventually be used to close the road. Um, so we weren't just looking at what was going on in, in this area, but we were looking at what was going on elsewhere in the city to make sure it wasn't causing problems um, or, or indeed to fix problems when they did happen. Now this, this technology is, you know, it's, it's commercially available, but I, I think a lot of cities perhaps don't have it right now. So one of the things that we're doing through the How Busy Is Tune program that Jenny's going to talk about um, is, is trying to, to make this more accessible to people. Uh, so if, if you've got a network of cameras and you want to collect some, some footfall data, then uh, I, would, I would welcome a chat or a, or a further workshop or something with you um, about how you can potentially use some open source um, software in order to do that and then to feed it into the, the How Busy Is Tune uh, system uh, that, that David's going to talk about later, um, and then if you if you just flick to the to the next slide, my my last slide. Um, so having been been fortunate to have all of this sort of footfall data, car park data, number plate recognition aggregates, not the actual number plates across the region, um, we were able to within a couple of weeks actually start to see exactly what COVID was was doing. Um, this, uh, if you go on the Urban Ob Observatory website, you can see these graphs uh, in, in near real time. They're updated every couple of hours. Uh, so you've got in the, in the top left, you know, the change in, in footfall from what was pre-COVID, um, which is the advantage of having three years worth of data. Um, on the right hand side, that's, that's comparison between um, uh, some recent days uh, and, and the sort of mean and the, and the normal sort of quantiles in which we'd expect footfall on the high street. And then on the bottom, you can see uh, you can see at the at the far left, uh, very low car park occupancy during the the deepest part of lockdown, and then uh, everyone suddenly hits the shops uh, in the good weather shortly after. So all of that data is there; it's all open, um, and and we we're looking for people to use it, but we're also looking for um, for other cities to sort of replicate this this kind of approach. And I'll leave it there. Great, thanks Luke. So you can see from, from Luke that there is this wealth of data in Newcastle and I suppose when faced with the pandemic we wanted to test this hypothesis so we could take this data and show it in a meaningful way to help respond to the challenges of the pandemic, not least obviously the horror story facing the high street which sadly shows um, no sign of, of going away in, in the short term. And certainly if you know Newcastle and you might recognise this as Northumberland Street, which is our one of our main retail areas. And obviously Newcastle is, is well known for its Geordie hospitality in pubs and restaurants, along with retail employs thousands and thousands um, of people across the city and generate millions for the local economy from our domestic trade and obviously from the tourist market as well. And it's fair to say that supporting people to visit the city centre is of key importance to the economic vitality of the city. 
So what we want to know, though, it's just our first um, technical test of the morning, your first chance to get involved. We're just really keen to hear about, you know, how do you feel about returning to the high street? Um, so if you've been able to grab your um, grab your device or or other tab and um, go on to menti.com and use the code 22822247. Um, and that should actually um, allow you to submit um, a, a couple of words um, to, or, or long, you know, a little phrase to basically just sum up, you know, how you feel or felt about returning to the high street if you've already done that. So I'll just give people a bit of a, a, a chance to do that while I try and show the, show the, uh, oh, put, where are we? Brilliant. Not interested in returning. That that's pretty strong. I think, yeah. So reluctant, unenthusiastic, apprehensive, cautious. I think I, I'd love to say I'm surprised to see those. Um, but but probably not. Curious, that's a really interesting one. Um, I think I would agree with that. I was really um curious to see what it would be like. And I have been back into town a couple of times. Um and I've actually been quite surprised in some cases around how busy it's been. Um, prefer to shop online. I think again, uh, you know, we're all on first name terms with with the postman and and the delivery drivers. Um, but from an economic development perspective, what does that mean for the, the those premises in the city centre and the jobs of of those people? Happy, fantastic. We've got a happy. Um, that that's really good. Necessary, yeah. So I think. I, you know, this is something that certainly um, David will be unpicking a little bit more in terms of the general um, feedback that we had, uh, that we have had. But but thank you for doing that. Um, that's really interesting. OK. Can click on the next So um, I think all of those, those, those feelings that people sort of uh, put there on the, on the Menti um, were, were what we were thinking that people were, were thinking and feeling. Um, so I guess from a, a recovery perspective, we started thinking, well, there's, there's actually probably four clear user needs that we need to try and, try and address here. We've got this data. You know, what are we trying to do? And, and as a resident, we needed people to feel safe so that they could come confidently into the city centre and, and spend their money. And clearly that leads on nicely to, well, as a retailer, I need shoppers to return to the high street so that I can maintain my business. And if people are maintaining their businesses, they're able to pay their business rates. So as a local authority, we need residents to feel safe to return to the city centre so that we sustain economic recovery and growth, protecting jobs and city vitality. And we also have a business improvement district within Newcastle as well, who represent the interests um, of those businesses in the city centre. And they really needed to drive um, customer footfall. So they want to support um, people to come into town um, so that businesses are sustainable and, and those businesses are, are their members. So really, um, where we got to was how do we bring that open data from the Urban Observatory? How do we bring the analytics capacity of the National Innovation Centre for Data, the business intelligence of any one hour business improvement district um, and the, the input of the council as well? How do we bring all of that together into something which might test some of those user needs? Um, so what we what we delivered was a, a very, very quick um, beta release of um, our product, howbusyistune.com. And if I can take credit for one thing, it is the name. So I'll just, I'll just get that out there. I didn't do any data analytics, but I did come up with the name. And we, we turned around a, a zero cost, uh, minimum viable product by bringing those partners together. So very much building on the smart city collaboration that we already have in place to test whether actually, well, hang on, is, this, is, is there something there? And I think ideally we would have done a bit more discovery to start with. We're doing this a little bit back to front, um, but we, we just wanted to get something out there. You know, that data is there already. Luke's been publishing that data for a, a long time. You know, how can we put it in a, a simple sort of traffic light system to give people an indication of how busy it is um, on Northumberland Street? 
Um, it also we also provided um, smart parking data as well to give that again that high level indication of how busy is is it in Newcastle um, and how you know how much space is there for social distancing and and we were absolutely blown away <laughs> I think by the the interest that the site actually had. Um, so we only pushed it through social marketing and promotion and we've had um, over 25,000 hits um, on it, um, a, a reach in terms of social, that they were, they were some figures from a little while back now, um, but you know, immediately sort of hitting over half a million people in terms of reach, um, just, just real interest in, in what we were doing and what the, what the product actually was. And we, we got some fantastic user feedback, which was, which was brilliant. And, and, and this is where, you know, so thank you, Charlotte Ferguson, for coming up with it. I wish they had this in Ikea. And I think it, that for me, it just really resonated because I thought, yeah, we, this, is, this is not rocket science. We're, we're just taking um, basic data that we've already got um, and presenting it to people to help them make decisions. And, and needless to say, um, obviously, when you, when you do something like this, people immediately sort of got on with that and started giving us some suggestions and, um, you know, additional features it could have and how well you could change the interface and, um, you know, actually it need, need to be more accessible. You might want to show things in this way. We had contact from other cities about, well, actually we're really interested in this. How do we get involved? We had, we were contacted by other organisations. So um, local bus companies say, well, can we start putting some information on, on there as well? Um, and I think for me overall, um, what it demonstrated fundamentally was that there was citizen interest in data, not just in Newcastle, but if you can put it across to people in a way that's actually meaningful for them. And it was just absolutely perfect timing um, that the Digital Fund C19 um, challenge came along into which we pitched the concept of, of developing this idea about citizen-centered data sharing. Um, and scaling up our our product in, and making it accessible and, and making it so that we can share it with other other cities. And so it was fantastic that we were um, successful in, in getting that funding because we feel that there, there are actually shorter and long term impacts of, of a product like this. So short term, actually give people a date there and get them into town, support them into town so that they can start spending some money. Um, but actually longer term around well, what does this mean for other types of data that we have about the city and how do we share that with people in a way that gets them using it and, and you know, changing possibly their individual decision making on that. Um, so as I say, we were successful in getting that MHCLG funding. So that was fantastic. And we really hit the ground running. Um, and we recruited Hedgehog Lab um, to help us to do this. So I'm now going to um, stop sharing my screen and hand over to David Scott, who can talk you through what we've been doing since then. Hi, everyone. Just bear with me one second there, just whilst I share my screen. Right. Can everyone, everyone see the presentation? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, so as Jenny mentioned, my name's David. Um, I work on the digital team at Hedgehog Lab and we are um, a digital agency um, based in Newcastle City Centre. So in terms of the project, our objective was to really, um, it was to really try and get to the heart of what requirements people needed in order to provide a safe return to the high street. So the way that we did this was through a three phase qual and quant study, which involved a survey. Um, we spoke to just under 300 people. Um, we also conducted a set of face-to-face -face interviews, which were remote, obviously. Um, and we also captured some real world evidence in the form of photos and videos um, from some of the guys that we worked with on the study. So you'll see here that the biggest bulk of our respondents came from the Northeast, but we did have respondents from all over the UK and the study itself wasn't Newcastle specific in the questioning. So we opened it up, um, so we, we opened the study up to people of all ages. And in the initial stages of the analysis, um, we decided to segment the audience down into generation. And we did this because we know, um, or because of um, assumptions that we made around how COVID affects the different generations. So across the survey, um, in the interviews, we asked a bunch of questions. Um, we wanted to know about what life was like before COVID and after COVID and how mental well-being had been affected. 
We wanted to talk about the return to the city centre and how things could be better. Um, and then finally, we explored um, directly what information people would want in order to plan a safe return to the city centre. So here we've got a quote from one of our Gen Z respondents that we interviewed about life pre-COVID. Um, I work full time, so I'd be going to work during the days and then sometimes after work, I'd be meeting friends at Weatherspoons for drinks or going out for a meal or going to the cinema on a weekend as well. I'd also occasionally meet friends for lunch. My friends work in an office near me, so we're meeting up over lunch hours. We've then got a millennial here who's talking out, talking sorry about life after um, the lockdown. So I think if I eat out once a week now, I would consider that a week that's quite exceptional. Most weeks I don't eat out at all. And here we have a baby boomer who responded, I haven't been anywhere. I'm one of those people that doesn't get on the list for shielding because of what I've got wrong with me. And if I didn't get offered a ventilator, I probably wouldn't come off it. My muscles are weak and my breathing is rubbish, but because we're not on the list, we have to make our own decisions. We looked at what mental well-being had been impacted through this period as well, and we found that there was a real mixture from people of high and low emotions, and people were worried about the impact of COVID on their future. But then what we also found was this theme of feeling grateful that people hadn't experienced as bad of a situation as some others. Now, all four generations that we asked on a, to select on a scale about how their mental well-being had been impacted leaned towards a negative impact. And you can see some of the common words and themes that we collected in our analysis there. Um, we heard stuff around kind of depression, job uncertainty, loneliness, isolation. But then we also heard on the flip side of that, people were feeling um, they had a better work-life balance, they were enjoying the slow pace, and they were grateful for healthy family and friends. We looked at what people's reasons were for visiting the city centre and I don't think it'll come as any surprise but the most popular reason to visit was to go shopping or to eat out or visit the pub. So even though these are non-essential reasons for visiting the city centre, um, you could see that there's a craving for a bit of normality and a bit of what life was like before so people were willing to visit the city centre for these reasons. We looked at what people's concerns were about returning to normal life. Um, and I think the three main tensions that were discovered were around people being worried about other people's behaviour. There's a worry around the inconsistency with regards to guidance and rules and whether people are following those guidance and rules. And then there's also a general worry around using public transport again. So all three of these tensions fed into how we then um, looked at the design and build of the, um, the new site for How Busy Is Toon. And I think this comment here um, kind of sums up a lot of what we heard. Um, people don't understand that a face mask is meant to cover your mouth and your nose. And this emoji was provided by um, the respondent as well. This collection of images that we've got here highlights some of the um, comments around the confusion around um, signage and systems and one way streets. And, the, and this was collected through the, um, the ethnographic side of things that one of our respondents collected. And then here you'll also see an account of a trip from Durham to Newcastle. Um, this person here mentioned that they were surprised at how empty the public transport was and that they did feel safer than what they were expecting. So there is a little bit of kind of um, perception versus reality going on here. And what we also discovered were um, a set of wants and needs off the back of the tension. So people want information on shops and restaurants. They want to understand how busy the city centre will be and they want to know what the safety measures are. And then there's this need for a better enforcement of the rules and for people to behave better. And at the time when we conducted this study, there was um, a need for more consistency around understanding what the rules are for mask wearing. So when you boil it all down, um, we need to help people um, plan when to go into the city, how to get there and then what to look out for once they're there. So. Based on the research findings, we looked at again the audience and we segmented this audience based around mindset because we know that not all generations um, think and behave the same. So what you'll see here is our, our mindset matrix. Now this is based on the findings and we've decided to, um, on the access labels to be split between someone who is not concerned to someone who's very concerned about the pandemic and then someone who is unsure or certain of the rules and the information available to them. So if we look at someone who is unsure and very concerned, we've described them as anxious. So I haven't really left the house for non-vital reasons, so I need all the information I can get for my peace of mind and safety. If 
We then look at somebody who is unsure and not concerned. We've described them as unbeturbed. So it's not as big of a deal as it seems. I don't know anyone that's affected and it's a lot of worry about nothing. We then have I'm not concerned and certain. So I just get on with it. You can't stay at home scared all of the time. I'm as careful as much as you can be. And then we have certain and very concerned and we've described them as vigilant. So even though I know what's going on, I keep up to date with the latest info, share things and provide feedback where I can to others. So it's, it's good to know, especially in light of recent changes, that these mindsets can change, although there is usually a correlation um, of personality type, and that's um, based on the kind of the baseline of a person. Jenny, do you want to do yeah, that? Yeah, it's, at it's just point? keen at this point, I guess, to, um, to have another thing really around, well, where, where do you feel that you sit in terms of those mindsets? Um, so um, we sharing. will, yeah, I'll share... All right, excellent, there we are. Somebody's already got in there, I can see. Um, yeah, tell us how, you know, where do you think you fit in terms of, in terms of those mindsets? A couple of people on the fence, maybe. It is quite a difficult one, because I would have described myself as one of the mindsets at the start of the situation, but I think I'm the other way now. I wonder whether other people have got that, got that going on too. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, Vision. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I'm probably more in the in the pragmatic box myself. Um, I think it just shows really that again, going back to to users and being able to understand that that not everybody is is coming to this situation with exactly the same viewpoint or exactly the same mindset. So we've got nobody who's unperturbed at the minute. I guess nobody who's um, maybe just going out there and perhaps hasn't got their mask on or, or whatever. Um, I think we're, we we seem a bit more on the on the vigilant side of things. But I think that's really interesting anyway. So thank you for taking part um, in that, I, David. I don't know if you feel that that kind of uh, mirrors, I guess, some of some of your findings as well. Yeah, I think it definitely does. Um, I think maybe the hesitation that people had to describe themselves there as well is quite telling um, because I know that amongst the team here at Hedgehog Lab, we're constantly talking about how our mindset is changing. But as I mentioned earlier, it's always very much um, rooted in your, I guess, your personality type. Um, so I'll share my screen again. And everyone can see that again? Yeah, fantastic, okay. So um, what we also did whilst we were conducting the research was to look at a range of sites and apps that we thought were potentially doing similar things to how busy is Toon. So we wanted to explore services that collected complex data um, from many sources and then presented that data back in useful ways. And we also wanted to look at services who were providing um, types of information that people in our survey and research sessions had asked to see. And you can see here, we looked at um, Google, um, Newcastle Gateshead, City Mapper, Trainline. And I'm just gonna show you a bit of, um, a bit of some of the, what we found. So you'll see here, um, this is the um, Google. So when you search for a business or a location on Google Maps, um, what you see here is um, some of the information that our um, survey respondents were asking to see. So you'll notice there that this is shop information. It's telling people when to plan their visit and when the, the busiest times are. And also this business here has um, also released a COVID statement to keep their um, customers up to date with how they're handling the situation. What you'll also see here on Trainline um, is a very useful and interesting tone of voice. So what we discovered through Trainline when we conducted the research is that they often use informative language that is not alarming. So they don't directly reference the pandemic, nor do they directly reference COVID-19 when they're talking about how they're keeping their customers safe. What they also do when they're collecting data from customers is um, they never use kind of red in terms of the traffic light symbol because we obviously know red kind of is associated with danger. So they use it almost a kind of a calming approach to inform their customers and it's never alarming. So what we discovered off the back of conducting the research is that tone of voice is very important as is language used. Use of color is also important so that you're not kind of um, keeping people on high alert. Um, we mentioned that an informative tone but not an alarming tone is really useful to have. 
Um, some of the feedback that we gathered in the survey um, from people suggested that there was a lack of trust in the information that was provided. So it's really key that the How Busy Is Tune site feels trustworthy. And also because this data could be seen as quite complex, um, we were very mindful that we need to make it useful and understandable to the, to the wider public. And that also fundamentally it's accessible by everybody. So I'm just giving you a quick overview here of what happened once we went into the design stages. So the team here at Hedgehog Lab across kind of developers, designers and research got together on um, what is a digital whiteboard that you can see here called Miro. Um, what we did at this point was to essentially kind of do a bit of an ideas um, dump and get all of our um, ideas out based on the research. And we started to create very, very kind of rough wireframes of how the how busy is tune site could look now based upon our findings. So you'll notice here that at the top we have um, broken it down so that we have a page that looks after how busy the city centre is. There is a page that looks at the city, at the city safety measures. So it's about informing and educating the public on what those are in the city centre. Um, we've also dedicated a page to shops and restaurant information, which is, we know, the most popular reason why people are returning to the city centre right now. And then what we also want to do is to inform and educate people around public transport, because we know there is a big concern and worry. And I've just essentially covered that, covered that there. But yeah, just to recap, the four fundamental pages on the site are how busy the city centre is and what the safety measures are what the information that the public needs to know about shops and restaurants, and then finally a page to educate them and inform them on how to travel into the city centre safely. And these are a bit more of a zoomed in look at what these um, wireframes are. What we then did following the wireframes is working with the design team, we put together what is very much the first iteration of what the final site could be. So you'll see here, um, the copy that we're using, lots of people are visiting the city centre right now. You may find social distancing easier at a different time. So we're suggesting that we inform the public with an informative statement that's very calming, um, not alarming at all. And this statement will change based upon how busy we know that the city centre is. You'll notice down the bottom here, we are suggesting to use a street camera so people can see as well how busy the city centre is and that will help them make a deform, an informed decision about returning. And then down the left hand side here, you'll notice that we are also crowdfunding data. So we're allowing people to tell us how they feel about visiting the city centre. And again, at no point are we using kind of any red um, to signify anything negative or to alarm anybody. The next page that we've got here is the, the first design or the first iteration of how we could start to inform people about what these um, safety measures are and what all the guidelines mean. We know that there's a public perception that other people aren't behaving, but it could be that people just don't understand what the rules are. So having a guide available to people on the site will help educate people. Hopefully that in turn would help them to start behaving a better way and also follow the guidelines. What we've also got here on the left hand side is the page for shops and restaurants. So Google actually provides a lot of the information that our survey respondents were asking for. So what we're suggesting at this point is that people will be able to select the restaurant that they wish to, um, to visit or the shop that they wish to visit. And then they'll be able to see the most up-to-date information that has been provided by that shop and restaurant about how they're managing the COVID-19 situation. And then finally, on the right-hand side here, you'll see that this is the page to help plan the journey. Um, Obviously, we know that we have already got car park data available, but what we thought would be useful would be to um, act as a directory so that people can see what the um, local transport companies are also doing. Um, we know from the research that some of them are doing some really interesting things with regards to real time tools and being able to see how many people are on the particular bus that you want to go on. So helping people choose um, which public transport service to use is, is going to be really key in order for letting them plan their, their visit into the city centre. And finally, here is just a smaller version of how this will look on mobile and it will be accessible across mobile and desktop. And that is where we are at the moment. So I can pass back over to Jenny. Great, thanks, David. If you stop sharing. Should I be able to see my screen now? Yeah, great. Okay, so I guess just to wrap up really around, you know, wh where we started uh, and where we've got to and then, and then what next. So 
very much started with a, a quite a, a clear sort of MVP around busyness and sort of focusing on like, well, we've got this data, how do we share that busyness information? And I think actually working with Hedgehog Lab has helped open our eyes and ears to, to what actually it is that people are interested in. And it isn't just the busyness. So it wasn't just about making sure that the busyness was there. It's about, oh, actually, how do you bring together all of these wide ranging data sources? I mean, to be honest, it, it, we can all feel a little bit overwhelmed with the amount of COVID related data at the minute. So I think we've definitely, you know, We'll have to maybe well maybe we'll think about the name. I think I think how busy is too is still the sort of leading leading part, but um it's obviously grown from just being about busyness to to being about actually how do we provide um information and data to people uh, within our city from a range of different sources in a way that's accessible for them and not overwhelming. And and so where we are next is that um, I mentioned obviously we're funded through the uh, local digital. Say uh, COVID nineteen challenge fund. Um, we're coming towards the end of end of the work that we set out as part of a part of that project. And um, you can find out more about the project on our particular project page there. Where there's also um, a number of blogs. So I did a blog about just a general summary of the project. Um, Luke's also done a blog about much more about the data side and actually how do you capture that data and you, know, you might be sat there thinking well we haven't got these camera we haven't got football sensors we haven't got car park data actually you know there's, there's more that you can do with the the infrastructure that you already have so if you already have cctv cameras then you're probably going to be able to do something with that there's open source products that you can do um and and luke is already supporting as he mentioned a couple of other cities on on how they take forward their existing network to to get football data as well um and actually, that's something that, you know, if you're interested in, in us maybe running a, a separate webinar or a workshop specifically on that, then then please do do get in touch. And um, if you're interested in seeing the final product, um, then the, our final show and tell is on Thursday, the 22nd of October at 11.30. So again, um, please get us to get in touch. We'll share the contact details in a minute. Um, or you can actually sign up through our project team, our project site as well, um, and, and come and see, you know, where that goes to, because ultimately this is a product that will be an open source product. So you'll notice that the, um, on the screens that David showed, um, it did say Newcastle upon Tyne at the top. Obviously it had our Newcastle upon Tyne branding on, our this our Newcastle branding. Um, it, you know, it, it'd be white labelled that you can actually take that and apply that for your city or town or or area um, and I think that actually you know we'll push to get that open sourced as, as quickly as we can and actually could be a really important tool in the lead up to Christmas I know a time when high streets generally are you know really buzzing with activity how do we how do we make sure that people feel confident about coming coming into the city into the city centres and really helping from a from a local economic um, viability perspective so thank you very much for, for listening. Um, be really keen um, to take any questions in the chat. I know there were a couple of comments in that. Um, I'll also just put up our contact details as well. So um, we're, we're all around um, on Twitter. Um, and as I say, you can get in touch with us via our project website or you can um, drop us a line um, on Twitter or by email, and and we'd love to hear from you. But but please do come and join our our final show and tell towards the end of the month, and and see what you can get your hands on um, for your own city centre. So I'll stop sharing, um, and then see if we've got any any comments in the chat. So, um, yeah. So Kat's made a comment say, um, even if people feel safe to return, they need to understand the value of returning to the city centre. What's the point and why is it better than shopping online? I think that is a really, a really good point because actually most of us are generally sort of driven, I suppose, by our own motivations and it's easier for me to shop online without necessarily thinking, well, actually, if I don't go into the sound centre and if, and if, if you multiply that across the population, that means that perhaps shops will be shut in, there won't be the turnover, there won't be the trade, we won't be able to attract um, events to the city. I think you're absolutely right. And that, that is probably something that um, needs to be part of the wraparound communications for, for how busy it's too. But definitely we're still you know, really trying to promote the idea that it is safe to come into the city centre um, and you, you, know, you will have a good experience when you do that. 
Uh, and thank you, Jez. That's very nice uh, to see a fabulous example of what can be done with a little imagination and some service design skills. Well done. Thank you. Well, um, as, this, as you'll be able to see, it did. It has progressed um, from its from its initial iteration to where it is now, and it'll continue to do so. So um, I think it just really reaffirms the importance of user needs and the importance of going back and actually understanding what it is that people want to see, and then and then delivering that in a in a in a sort of interactive way. Uh, did you face challenges getting different parts of council to share their data? Um, so I'll, I can mention the cultural one or technical challenges for extracting, pulling in that data. I might pass that over to Luke. Um, culturally, to be honest, I think we're, uh, we're a lot further down the track now. So um, the data, the football data, the car parking data, that's data that's been available for years now. Um, I'm not sure whether there were any barriers at the, at the start of that, maybe Luke can say. I definitely do still have to have some conversations internally about new data sets that we would like to share. And there's this general sort of nervousness about, well, are people are just going to use that data to, to screw us over, <laughs> effectively. You know, then it's generally seen in quite a, a negative way. And also, I think I've been trying to um, support colleagues um, to move away from the idea that just because you can't think of what you would do with that data doesn't mean that you shouldn't open it and actually you shouldn't necessarily try and second guess what people might want to do with that data. Um, so, so generally, yes, there are still some challenges. Uh, generally, I think born out of a, probably the FOI culture and a, and a, a concern that people will use the data in a, in a negative way. But I think we've probably got enough examples now to try and counteract um, some of that and actually be able to show it, 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 it is really beneficial. Luke, from a technical perspective, has it been challenging? Uh, yes and no. Um, so with the with the highway cameras and the car parking data, for example, the the um, traffic management centre actually, uh, before the urban observatory was a thing, they were already publishing that. Um, so they they'd already already made the case. Um, when we put new cameras up, it's it's quite a simple process now. Um, but but the early ones that we put up, I, I think. We, we have a slide we like to use in our presentations where I think it's something like 300 emails and, and God knows how many how many meetings and people were involved for the first ever sensor that we put up. So we've come a long way from there. I think the other thing to say is, and I can't remember if it did show this on the feedback slide, but we did definitely get some feedback from people saying, where are you getting this data from? This is Big Brother um, straying off into 5G and then into COVID and all of that kind of thing. And um, so there definitely is um, a sort of PR message there around where the data comes from, you know, how it's collected, making sure that you have robust data protection and privacy statements in place to make sure that, you know, if you are challenged, then you, you, you're absolutely solid around, well, this is actually what we're doing. This is how we're collecting it. This is who it's being shared with and being able to, um, to share some of that. Um, Alison, would we be able to share some examples that help with the information governance concerns? I think, Luke, in your blog, you have linked to something, haven't you? Uh, I have. Um, not, not sort of specific DPIAs or, or, you know, other sort of data protection stuff, but we, we do have all of those. What we, what we are very careful to avoid is actually tracking people. We don't, we don't pick up faces or anything like that. The, the algorithms are trained to detect the outlines of people. Um, and we, we actually have some research going on uh, about trying to improve the privacy of these approaches as well. So we pre-process the CCTV in, in one of those projects to turn it into just outlines before anyone even looks at it. Um, so yeah, we, we, we've done a lot of work to try and make it as acceptable as possible. Most of the systems that we run, they just tick over in the background. No one ever actually looks at the imagery. Great. Um, I think we've probably got time for maybe one or two other questions. I've just put the um, the link there to the project site as well, which is where the blogs are. Um, so um, we'll try. We can keep putting some information on there if that if that's useful. Um, Craig, can you um, Danny, can you describe the process from someone having the idea um, to pull in the various collaborative teams together to produce the finished product? I think genuinely, and this is why I maybe laboured the point at the start, is we put. The, we had those foundations in place from a significant amount of effort over the last 18 months to two years to try and bring that city programme together. So 
recognising that the council has a role to play, the university can play a role, businesses can play a role. Actually, I genuinely, um, I genuinely can't think about, I, I don't know if the COVID situation is just a huge blur now, but I can't actually think where, where the, when the first conversation happened. But very quickly, we had a representative from National Innovation Centre for Data. We had Luke and, and his colleagues. We had um, myself from the council. We had representative from our business improvement district. And it really was, you know, just one of those Zoom calls where we're like, right, actually, we've got this data. How do we present it in the most um, accessible and user friendly way? And I think, like I say, looking back now, it was great that those relationships already existed so we weren't having to try and knock on people's door to say can you help us with this and uh, we've had this idea can you help there was that willingness was already there that sort of approach to collaboration so i would say try and put um you know put those those pieces in place and um, where you can uh, perhaps outside of a pandemic and um, so that you've got that that group there that you can call upon to when needed and really respond to challenges like this. I think really that um, my sort of lesson learned is that we've been, uh, we have ended up doing this a little bit back to front. And I think, but I think that is a, I think that's the the pressure of dealing within the, of re reacting within the pandemic. So um, we, you know, there wasn't um, a huge amount of discovery that went on <laughs> at that, that first conversation. It was like, well, we've got this and we're going to put it out there and we're just going to see how it goes. Um, but certainly we're also happy to see how it goes as an MVP, which again, politically can be quite interesting because, you know, I'm happy to say I never particularly liked 